All right, a very, very good evening, everybody who is watching us live on Facebook from Elpro International School and Wapping High at Central London. It is indeed a pleasure to be hosting the first virtual project between the two schools. It's been an honor to partner with Wapping High, which is at Central London, and my heartfelt gratitude goes out to Mr. Gary Nelson, the head teacher at Wapping High, and to Ms. Nicolette Sorba, the assistant head teacher at Wapping High, who have been instrumental in ensuring that uh, we see this day where we have our students presenting their first virtual project to you through a simulation of a press conference. I am very honored to have Ms. Nicolette Sorba with us. Uh, Nicolette, why don't you say a few things? Uh, well, that was a very, very warm wel welcome from you. And I just want to say on behalf of the whole school that we've thoroughly enjoyed this project. Uh, we're very grateful to you for having invited us to be part of a project and for hosting it today. I think my students have really relished the opportunity to get to know your amazing students and to work collaborat collaboratively across continents and via Zoom. And at, at a time when we're facing a sort of a, an international crisis and students are in lockdown, it's been an, an incredible experience to be able to make these links between our students and your students and to work on this great project which we hope will be the first of many to come. So a special thanks to you Saganda for making it all happen and, uh, and we're looking forward to future projects uh, uh, in the future. Thank you so much Nicolette. And uh, like you mentioned, yes, I think we have been very excited. The students have put in a lot of hard work and we are very proud of them to, you know, kind of do this project so beautifully. I'm sure the audiences will now see uh, what they have to uh, present to us. Uh, we also have here Ms. Richa Bhatia, who is the activity in charge of the school, again, uh, who has been guiding the students throughout for this project. Richa, why don't you say hello to our audiences? Hi everyone, good evening. It has been a wonderful experience working with such, uh, such wonderful uh, students and the team has uh, put in tremendous efforts for the same. I wish them all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Richa. Before we start and I hand the baton to the students, I'll just like to make a small disclaimer here. Um, okay, one second. Yeah, so uh, we just wanted to say that the students are simulating the characters that they are playing. However, the thoughts, ideas and speech presented in this virtual project are of the students research into this topic. Uh, they are only simulating the people uh, uh, from different uh, organizations and agencies here. So I think we are good to start. Good afternoon. I am Lucia Prince. Senior Political Editor for the BBC in the UK. And I'm Akanksha Mala, Editor-in-Chief from CNN 18 India. We would like to welcome you to this international broadcast brought to you from the BBC in London in partnership with CNN 18 from India. Today, we have brought together some of the most renowned international experts from around the world to explore a number of pressing questions that have arisen from this worldwide COVID-19 pandemic. Firstly, I would like to introduce Mr. Anthony Fossey, an American physician who has served as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Welcome, sir. Next, we have Mr. Carson Brzezeski, who is the Chief Economist, Eurozone, and Global Head of Macro for ING Research. We are honored to have you here today. We also have among us Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations, who will be giving us an insight into the global steps taken to curb the situation. Welcome, sir. And finally, we also have the pleasure of having Mrs. Joyce Misuza with us. Ms. Pesuza is a Tanzanian microbiologist and environmental scientist and serves as the Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program at the level of Assistant Secretary General. Welcome, ma'am. 
We would like to begin by exploring how our current experience of COVID-19 compares to previous global pandemics. We will then be looking at the choices made by political leaders from different nations to curb its spread, and we will also explore the economic impact of the pandemic. Furthermore, we will be asking if there have been any gains during this extended period of lockdown, for example, in environmental terms, and we will also be considering what lessons can be learned from these events. During the transmission, should you have any questions to put to our experts, please put it in the comment section below. To begin, I would like to introduce our BBC reporters, Scarlett Bruin and Dominique Sadwe. Thank you, Lucia. Mr. Paulsey, before we understand the global effects of COVID-19, can you talk to us about scientifically how we have dealt with something like this in the past? Is there one common factor that links past and then to our current one? Hi, thank you for inviting me. It's absolutely amazing to see such initiatives, which will help spread information when our leaders and the common public panic. Coming to your question, there is only one thing I have noticed that has been a recurring theme throughout many of these epidemics. All of these diseases have one thing in common, and that is they all began when an animal virus merged with a human virus to create something so deadly. Talking about our past pandemics, I think it's always been like this. Chaos and panic have led the way rather than medicine and proper policies. Can you tell us about the Nipah virus and the H1N1 flu, which managed to wipe out 24% of the population? Is COVID-19 capable of working on a similar lines? Can we stop it from following this pursuit? And what would you suggest to our world leaders? That's indeed a very good question. And I'm very happy to see that we've started off with the basics. Studying and gaining knowledge about past pandemics has always helped us with the present and the future. Talking about the Nipah virus, it is a virus that particularly impacted Asian countries and was started off by a pig to human transference. Many measures had to be taken and several towns were quarantined if there was a suspected case anywhere residing in the village, much like today's times. Although this virus is not so rampant in 2020, there is no vaccine for either the humans or animals infected. This is very similar to SARS, which was also belonging to the family of coronaviruses and does not have a vaccine to this day. If we talk about H1N1, the virus which was first detected in the United States and eventually spread across the world. 10 years later, I think we're still working on better understanding this virus and preparing for the next pandemic. However, this virus continues to circulate as a seasonal flu virus and well, it causes illness, hospitalization and deaths worldwide every year. So if you see in a way, there are cases where the virus still prevails in our world and we haven't really found a vaccine for it. As of today, a lot of us around the world are working on solving this pandemic and getting ahead. But as I repeatedly said in many interviews, I believe that moving on is not the situation here. We need to fix the problem at hand and adapt to the, to the new normal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fossey. Today we also have with us Mr. Karsten Brzezki, who is the Chief Economist, Eurozone of Macro for ING Research. He'll be giving us a critical analysis of the situation in terms of the economic slowdown. Welcome, sir. Um, as Mr. Fauci has already told us about the past pandemics and their relevance with COVID-19, but let's come to the present. Can you give us an overview of the impact on the global economy? Yes, definitely. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this platform. It's great to be here today. One thing to understand in these dreaded times is that over 2.2 billion people have been placed under a lockdown in over 40 countries and movement of men and material has been completely paralyzed in many parts of the world. Um, manufacturing, logistics, as well as the service sector involving movement are completely shut down almost everywhere, which is the main cause of the dire effect on our economy today. 
many of the industries uh, which are severely affected would be the tourism sector the sports and entertainment sector the food industry or the building and construction industry but i feel that the main problem here is that governments are mainly focusing on large industries and large companies very few nations have ad addressed this issue at a micro level that is true can you explain further as to what kind of problems need to be addressed at micro level right so basically when i say micro level i mean that every week millions of people across the globe are losing their jobs many small businesses and practices are struggling to survive daily wage workers have no means of supporting themselves in these times and are completely dependent on local ngo support groups but most importantly they are dependent on their own governments clearly these are very hard times for big businesses small businesses and, and of course for workers what about economic projections for the future so basically in the in march of this year the oecd estimated that global growth will be half to nearly 1.5% but that was definitely optimistic because the most recent estimates in june suggest an unprecedented collapse in the first half of 2020 and almost 13% decline in the global gdp uh, i have a very interesting graph here to show our audience so if you have a look at the projections for 2019 20 and 21 you will notice that most nations have seen a decreased um, annual percentage change in gdp and a lot of them have entered negative territory as well for 2020 and even though we will be um, bouncing back in 2021 um, it is it is obvious that all the support packages that the uh, that nations have been giving out right now will have long lasting and complex effects so it is important that they handle the, uh, the situation right now very efficiently otherwise it can have dire effects in the long term Thank you Mr. Brzezinski. Mr. Ban Ki-moon, we have heard here about the terrible economic impacts on people and their jobs. So, can you throw us some light on the steps countries can take or have taken to provide relief to their citizens in such difficult times? That's a great question. So, during previous economic crises, a number of countries actually turned quickly to stimulus packages. In many cases, this included building more coal power plants, upgrading roads, investing in heavy industries such as automobile manufacturing and more and actually following that old playbook to respond to the covid-19 pandemic would be a terrible mistake as it would just amplify the air pollution health crisis another huge and upcoming crisis and weather conditions due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic have already been described as a silver lining to the coronavirus lockdown and at the same time many people have already expressed concern that this improving condition will not continue after lockdown ends and the situation will continue to worsen as countries look to give their economies a much needed jolt in the wake of the covid-19 outbreak governments and companies essentially have two choices they can either lock in decades of polluting inefficient high carbon and unsustainable development or they can use this as an opportunity to accelerate the inevitable shift to low carbon and increasingly affordable energy and transport systems that will bring long term economic benefits and the latter will also fight two major health crises that is air pollution and the growing climate emergency mrs maisusa what are your views on the situation highlighted by mr ban ki moon Well, to be honest, I was expecting this question. Now, the lockdown due to the coronavirus pandemic has certainly led to weather changes that just cannot be ignored and left unnoticed. We're experiencing clearer skies, improving air quality, decreasing carbon emissions, and the reason as to why this is happening is rather simple: transport use, electricity demand, and industrial activity have reduced. Streets are empty, cities are silent, factories are closed. vehicle traffic is also reduced and all of this is giving the planet a much needed respite now it might be right to say that the coronavirus lockdown has been good to the environment i agree that these conditions may not last long if 
pre-pandemic activities continue with the same vigor even after the pandemic? Okay. Could you also suggest ways we can protect the environment even after lockdown ends? Definitely. Considering the growth in the tertiary sector, telecommuting from home, for those who can, even just for a couple of days a week, can have a marked reduction in terms of emissions. Governments must not backtrack on the massive air quality gains post the COVID-19 crisis. So you need to move towards renewable energy faster instead of using coal and non-renewable energy. And carbon projects is also an affordable measure to keep climatic conditions from deteriorating. Mr. Fawcett, we understand the virus has created an impact everywhere, but you previously talked about how studying history is a much better approach to solving these issues. When we do look at past pandemics, they had an impact which is much more severe in comparison to COVID-19. If this is the case, then how do governments react when trying to aid people in staying safe? Yes, I definitely agree. So if you see, the governments didn't really know what to do, which is the case in many countries today as well. So what happened then was that people ordered, people were ordered to wear masks, schools and theaters were closed, and bodies were piled up in makeshift mocks. Now, during those times, if we see the medical industry had not advanced as much as today. So temporary solutions were viable. However, today, when we have the technology and money, it is our duty to use it. We're a global village, therefore it should have been easier for us to combat these certain discrepancies and move forward. If we do want solutions to the problem at hand, then honestly setting up research labs, promoting hands-on learning, and encouraging global communication should be our go-to answer. I suggest our political leaders do not go about imitating policies which are incompetent and honestly raise a question towards your leadership. Okay, so thank you. Mr. Brzezewski, as Mr. Fossey mentioned, uh, today our economy is based on globalization and most companies have manufacturing units dispersed all over different countries. So how has the global lockdown impacted international trade and manufacturing? Um, that's a very good question, actually. So basically trade and output are having unavoidable declines and they will have painful consequences for households and businesses on top of the human suffering that is already caused by the disease itself. I think a major impact on companies was due to the initial lockdown in China. For a few years now, China has been the central manufacturing hub of many global business operations. So any, um, any disruption in China's output is sure to have repercussions elsewhere through regional and global value chains. But I feel that at a time like this, keeping trade flowing requires cooperation and trust. For example, that the market will supply essentials, that countries will not impose export restrictions, and imports do not pose health risks. Um, it would be very easy for our audience to understand the trend of trade with this representation over here. So if you can see, uh, even after the financial depression of 2008 and 2009, we were never really able to go back to how we were before the depression, which is dotted by the gray uh, line. And coming to the years 20, 2020, 2021, and 2022, you see that there are two scenarios. The red line uh, shows the pessimistic scenario and the green one shows the optimistic scenario, both, both of which suggest that there will be a rebound in uh, trade and manufacturing, but it would be very difficult for us to match to what we were before, which is the yellow line over here. So I feel that right now it would be unrealistic to keep hoping that we would go back to something that we were before, but we can definitely work towards uh, efficiently managing everything right now so that this does not leave long lasting effects. Mrs. Maisisa, Mr. Brzezewski just spoke about the decrease in manufacturing and it is a fact that all kinds of manufacturing results in a significant carbon footprint. So once manufacturing and trade starts rising again, we need alternatives to ensure that carbon emissions do not start soaring again. In your previous answer, you talked about carbon projects as a solution for improving climatic conditions. Could you elaborate more on the carbon projects? Definitely. 
I would love to give an example of the carbon project in the Chulo Hills of Southeast Kenya. Now, over here, income from the sale of carbon credits as a result of the region's critical forests, woodlands, and grasslands being protected and are providing a cushion to local communities when the area's other main employer, in this case, ecotourism, is on hold. The project aims at providing the community with infrastructure, including water tanks, cattle crushes, and around 400 beehives. We can also take an example of the Altamayo Forest in Peru, where a similar carbon project helped reduce illegal deforestation by about 75%. Another notable point is that in this area, when COVID-19 exports were put on hold, income from carbon credits was able to ensure that people could remain employed and fed making this an incredible initiative to help sustain the ecosystem and to ensure sustainable employment. However, we would need a combined and coordinated effort of governments and citizens to actually achieve our goal. Currently, some countries have changed several of their environmental policies, and these decisions shall heavily influence the air, water, and wildlife around us. So while carbon projects is a way to sustain and take care of the environment, its goal cannot be achieved if a combined effort is important. Ms. Brzezinski, Mrs. Mansouza has just given us quite an insight as to how carbon projects can significantly decrease the global carbon footprint. It is known that crude oil production contributes to around 5% of the global total carbon emissions, and during the past few months, oil demand has fallen a great deal, which definitely has led to a positive impact on the environment. But economically, what kind of repercussions are OPEC nations going to face due to this? So basically, first of all, it is important to understand that the lockdown measures put in place to contain the spread of COVID-19 represent an unprecedented shock to the global oil demand right now. I would like to talk to our audience about a condition called Super Contango that has sent oil markets into a frenzy. Um, so basically, a contango market implies that oil traders believe crude prices will rally in the future. Thus, spot prices are being offered at super discounts to future prices. But then this year, oil prices fell due to the lockdown and this time gap widened tremendously. So if you have a look over here, right. So uh, if you have a look at the crude oil prices over the years, you will see that even in the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, uh, oil prices did not dip as low as they did now. And on April 20th of this year, we made history when oil prices closed off at minus $37 a barrel, which technically means that producers had to pay people to get stock off their hands. And this is something which would be uh, very, very difficult for nations who completely depend on crude oil for their income. For example, Algeria and Nigeria, who require uh, the prices to be around $100 per barrel to balance their government books and to prevent their economy from completely crashing. If that's the case, then why don't companies announce a temporary cut down on production of oil? Um, the thing is, keeping aside the theoretical aspects of this, operationally, there is only up to a certain extent that a company can reduce production. To cut production further, they may have to seal their oil wells and thus risk losing their asset permanently. And strategically, this would also mean recurring capital and abandonment expenditures for the company when the market does revive, and they will be losing their market share to their competitors in the long run. So if major oil producing nations like the OPEC countries choose to do this, their currency might devalue significantly. Can you give us some specifics on the impact on Saudi Arabia considering that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has received a lot of criticism for bidding discounted oil prices in early 2020? Right. Um, so basically this price war began between Saudi Arabia and Russia when Saudi Arabia failed to convince Russia to reduce production of oil, an agreement that had been reached with all the members of the OPEC group. Um, so early March, Saudi Arabia decided to ram up its oil production and offer discounts to buyers in a bid to win market share because it failed to reach an agreement with Russia. But the thing is, by the time the Saudis, Russians and other major, uh, major oil producers agreed to cut output, it was already too late. 
daily demand had already fallen by more than 20 million barrels a day because of the lockdown and and the thing is saudi arabia is a nation that is still recovering from its last major drop in oil prices in 2014 over that uh, saudi arabia suffered even more because they stopped all the pilgrimages including the annual hajj, hajj to mecca which uh, hasn't been interrupted in a very very long time so the irony of the situation rests in the fact that saudi arabia triggered this oil price war to punish russia a country which is far less vulnerable to drops in the price of crude oil as compared to saudi arabia itself thank you mr brzeski Like crude oil, plastic waste and plastic pollution continue to remain a contributor to land degradation and its hazardous effects are very well known. Miss Masisa, can you tell us of if the coronavirus lockdown resulted in a decrease of its usage? If yes, how could we ensure that such a decrease continues in the future? You know, it's truly remarkable to see how so many questions deal with certain futuristic ideas to effectively tackle climate change. So, private companies like Apple are using plastic to make and provide face shields, and they were planning to ship one million face shields to hospitals in the United States every week. So, it hasn't entirely led to the decrease in the usage. but we can see that during the pandemic steps were and are being taken to use plastic efficiently as for solutions countries should invest in sustainable disposal infrastructure improving waste collection systems and they can do so by splitting the islands into zones to make the most efficient use of shared resources plastic recycling centers should also be set up now over here plastic would be recycled to obtain fuel from it and this fuel can be distributed in villages for various purposes as a replacement for kerosene and for generators and in boilers making it a very efficient solution thank you miss misuza i think we have discussed and um understood the environmental repercussions of the covid-19 lockdown at length let's talk about the humanitarian aspect of it Billions of people have filed for unemployment in these difficult times. Mr. Brzeski, can you tell us which sectors have seen the highest level of unemployment? Right. Um so basically the International Labour Organization has estimated that globally more than 25 million jobs would be threatened due to the spread of coronavirus. If you see the US, UK, Canada and most of the European and Asian countries have already begun to register huge job losses leading to a significant rise in the unemployment rate now there are high concerns for low paid and low skilled informal workers especially in low and middle income countries where the proportion of such workers is very high and they completely lack any kind of social product protection um and the thing is that this sudden loss of livelihood would have a horrifying impact on them also uh, casual workers Uh, are more vulnerable right now because of their irregular nature of work and the daily wage payment even regular salaried or contractual skilled workers and shopkeepers who may be sitting at home idle right now or have returned to their native places may not be able to recover their jobs once they come back after the lockdown is over and if you think about small entrepreneurs or self employed people many of them will not be left with the capital to restart their business after this lockdown is over i think mr banki moon will be able to give us some insight as to what kind of steps governments can take to provide relief in such a situation thank you mr brzeski uh, mr brzeski has raised some great points and has given a great encapsulation on the whole scenario however to provide more information to the spectators here i would just like to show, show you guys some data when we see this graph over here there is enormous and very concerning spike in this employment rate in this unemployment rate which is certainly a huge concern to the whole world community and now to share some more information about this for combating this as a whole countries regions and cities can quickly develop a grassroots view of where jobs are at risk 
and where there is additional demand for labor, either by sector, occupation, and geography. And that you need to put special focus on small businesses and the most unsafe workers, including those in the gig economy and the informal sector. We need to build smart cross-sector solutions to get that help to them fast. As governments prepare to reopen economies post lockdown, they need to find smart ways to maximize employment and protect against new infections. Again, as Mr. Brzezewski just said, special focus will be needed on restarting and supporting small businesses, which account for majority of jobs in most countries. At the same time, governments and businesses will need to create new mechanisms to help people whose jobs are at a risk and redeploy them into occupations in which the labor demand still outstrips the supply and rapidly build the skills needed for their new roles. So these are particular ways that countries, regions, and cities, which they can adopt to make this a much more safer situation for all. As Mr. Ban Ki-moon pointed out, we need to find smart ways to protect ourselves against the new infection and how new viruses strains may be related to the ones we already know about. So I think, Mr. Fucci, a common question that arises often is how similar COVID-19 is to SARS and MERS, considering that they are all strains from the same disease. I definitely agree with what Mr. Brzezewski and Mr. Moon have just highlighted. And that is why I believe we encourage research rather than speeches and political vendetta. Talking about the coronaviruses, as you mentioned, they are actually more similar than we think. They all mutate, as most viruses do, and their symptoms can be quite similar. However, SARS and MERS are much harder to catch because of their low R0. So there has never been a much worldwide scare like the COVID-19 has been. So if you see this comparison chart that I will just share with you, you see that all of these are respiratory viral infections. That is, they will mainly impact your this region. Um, now, if you see the fatality rate of SARS and MERS is much higher. That is why some people dread being caught by it. However, the catching the virus as a whole is much low. Therefore, the scare has been more in terms of COVID-19 rather than the other coronaviruses. Arnold, the one word that everybody has been on their mouth since the virus originated. Can you tell us what this means and how it impacts the virus? Definitely. The reproduction number or R0 is a mathematical term that tells you how contagious or infectious a disease can be. Specifically, it's the number of people who catch the disease from one sick person in an outbreak, if you see. Now, um, this very clear picture will show you how R0. So patient zero is basically the first person to contract the virus. He spreads it to two people and they eventually spread it to two other people. So if you see, eventually it goes on to spreading to other people. Now, if we compare viruses as a whole, you see the COVID-19, it has an R0 that sits around 2 to 2.5. That means one person who is infected can spread it to 2 to 2.5 people on an average when nobody's infected, uh, nobody's vaccinated, apologies. The H1N1 virus, however, sits at 1.2 and 1.6, which is comparatively low to the COVID-19. The Ebola virus and measles, if you've heard of it. Measles is one of the viruses that has a very, very high uh, R0. It sits around 18. That means one infected person can spread it across to 18 other people, again, when nobody's vaccinated. So if you see R0 is not R0 is basically helps helping us to understand how contagious or how infectious a disease is. And when we compare it across several pandemics, we see COVID-19 is still on the lower side when compared to um, diseases like measles, Spanish flu, H1N1, but considered deadly when we compare it to viruses like Ebola, SARS, and MERS. Thank you. So we have just heard about a lot of contagious diseases, but there are so many things that we living in developed nations do not understand. 
For example, how are countries that are already suffering from a humanitarian crisis, like Yemen, being impacted and how can they possibly cope with this added pressure of a pandemic? That is actually an excellent question, but the problem is that it doesn't have a very clear answer because it is very hard to get a clear picture of the condition in such nations where a humanitarian crisis is going on for the simple reason that there are no trusted sources of information and the media does not show us the correct picture. But uh, coming to Yemen, perhaps no other country is more vulnerable to COVID-19's depredations than Yemen is right now. Because even before the virus's arrival, the country was grappling with the world's largest humanitarian crisis in the world um, as a result of their ongoing civil war. So Yemen's official coronavirus caseload is actually among the lowest in the Middle East, but that is most certainly misleading because the WHO has recorded only about 253 confirmed cases in a population of 28 million people. And in neighboring Oman, authorities have confirmed over 8,000 cases with a population one-sixth the size. So the thing is, Yemen has a minuscule case count only because of the near total absence of testing. And now, after staging massive aid operations in Yemen for so many years, the United Nations itself is running out of cash as donations from member countries who are busy battling COVID-19 on their own turf right now. And if you think about it, after years of war and after years of having no proper services, people in general don't trust what the media says and they don't trust the authorities. Yemen is a nation where people are already suffering from widespread starvation, a malaria epidemic and a cholera outbreak. And at this point, donations and NGOs are not a sustainable option. A child dies every 10 minutes in Yemen and the only way possible in which we can prevent Yemen from getting completely wiped out from the face of the globe is by providing political stability, something that only Saudi Arabia and the United States can accomplish there. Um, thank you, Mr. Brzezinski. The condition of people in Yemen is shocking, and we would like to remind our spectators that Yemen needs our attention, and we urge all of you to take any step possible in raising awareness and making donations. Thank you, Mrs. Maisisa. I would now like to talk to you about the effects lockdown has had on the fauna. For example, the lack of human presence has led to the return of certain wild animals in urban and rural areas, should these effects be considered a positive or a negative thing? Well, in previous answers, I talked about lockdown and how it means a lot less traffic on the roads and less pollution. And clearly, this gives wildlife space to thrive. However, it means some people are being driven to extremes to support themselves through poaching, yet another threat for wild animals. During lockdown, people can't go to work, especially those in the informal market, because these people rely on going out every single day to, uh, to make ends meet and come back with some food. And this is leading to an increase in poaching for bushmeat. Animals haunted for bushmeat are not the only ones at risk. The rhino, which is poached for its horn, is also vulnerable. Now, international travel restrictions may have hampered wildlife trafficking across borders, but it is also leaving wild animals in the wild with much less protection. On the other hand, however, bees during lockdown are finally getting a break. One of the biggest environmental impacts of the global shutdown has been the significant reduction in air pollution. Now, pollutants break down the scent molecules emitted by plants, making it harder for bees to detect food. This means they often end up flying further to find food and bring it back to their nests. In a world with less air pollution, bees can make shorter and more profitable trips, and this may help them rear more young. So it would be right to say that lockdown has had both positive and negative effects on animals, and I've given proof of both of them. Um, and what steps should be taken for the welfare of vulnerable wild animals? Well, yet again, carbon projects will fit in as a solution. 
along with solutions like backyard poultry production, because this shall dramatically reduce pressure on terrestrial and aquatic wildlife and is one way of ensuring food security and trying to reduce the scarring amounts of bushmeat hunting. Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Mr. Mayusa spoke about food security, and this is a major issue in nations with a higher population. So isn't it harder for a nation with larger population to deal with pandemic like this? How will a country like India provide effective relief to their citizens? So that's a great question and a very valid observation. So considering the fact that managing pandemics in large countries like India is extremely tough, an action plan should be formulated such that the policy decisions are taken on both a central and a grassroots level. So what the central government of India should probably be doing now is firstly expanding, training and deploying healthcare and public health workforce. Secondly, implementing a system to find every suspected case at a community level. Thirdly, ramping up production, capacity and availability of testing. And lastly, identifying, adapting and equipping facilities to manage risk, treat and isolate patients. So these measures are the best way to suppress and stop transmission so that when restrictions are lifted, the virus won't resurge. And the last thing any country needs is to open school and schools and businesses only to be forced to close them again because of a resurgence. In times like this, coordination between central and state governments will be crucial. So what do you think the state government should be doing to curb this situation? Absolutely correct. Coordination is very valid at this time. So what the state government should be doing right, right now is arrangements for testing, making arrangements for isolation and treatment of mild and moderate cases. Thirdly, they need to make arrangements for treatment of severe patients and for providing critical care. And lastly, addressing human resource requirements and ensuring supply chain management. Um, thank you, Mr. Moon. Some people have argued that the coronavirus pandemic is a blessing in disguise. Mrs. Maisisa, what are your views on this statement? Well, that is a great question, and I'm very glad someone brought that up. Now, I would definitely agree with the fact that this pandemic has given us time to reflect on our actions. We know that pollution is reducing, and nature is, in a way, reclaiming itself. And I've also given reasons to support that fact in previous answers. And there's a rather interesting graph that I would like to show to everyone. So this graph shows that, that more people think that climate change is as important as coronavirus, that the percentage of people agree that in the long term, climate change is as, a, is, is as serious a crisis as COVID-19. Now, once people have seen and realized that the condition around them is improving, it might appeal to their conscience and make them work for the betterment of the environment. So this has allowed us to think and to deliberate and to understand that this positive impact on the environment may be temporary and that governments and individuals should learn from this lockdown on how to reduce pollution in, in the long term. Thank you, Ms. Masuza. Finally, I would like to ask Mr. Brzezeski. How long is it going to take to rebuild the global economic fall due to this pandemic? I think that is a question that a lot of countries are looking to answer. But the thing is, this isn't a question that has a definite answer. But I want you to consider our history. So let's take the Great Recession that was brought on by fundamental overreach in 2008. Now, there were underlying problems in the economy. There was too much debt. There was overbuilding of housing. We were just overextended and that was hard to cure. It took us a long time to work out those things. But what just happened now, there was nothing like a housing bubble or the extraordinarily high levels of household debt we had in 2008. This was just an act of nature that forced us to shut down a large part of our economy. So you don't have that kind of underlying drag from the past excesses that we had last time. And I feel that once the threat of the virus lifts, it will not take us long to get back on our feet. What do you exactly mean by when the virus lifts? See, basically everything hinges on epidemiology. 
in the 1918 influenza outbreak there was a first wave that preceded and then a monstrous second wave and that unfortunately does look like a real possibility for us if this virus hangs in there then all my arguments about how the economic scarring from this is not so severe that we can't recover fast enough will become completely irrelevant because we cannot recover fast if the virus is still hanging around so do you think that once we make a full uh, recovery from the virus we will economically be able to go back to how we were before the pandemic so full recovery is a tough standard absent a vaccine or herd immunity there will probably still be some drag we may have an interesting situation where the economy is growing quite rapidly starting later this year or early next year but we are so far down that rapid growth still doesn't get us back to where we started and at the end it comes down to individual nations and how efficiently they manage the situation for some particular nations right now their presidents are prioritizing their economy over the health of their citizens and this will only lead to distrust for the authorities among the citizens and condemnation from the global community mr fucci mrs berleski spoke about the importance of epidemiology in economic recovery so as an expert do you think that there will be a second wave of this virus and do you think that we will handle it any better than last time second waves that's what a lot of people have been talking about but uh, my only question would be why create chaos when we haven't even started dealing with the first wave in my opinion definitely there will be a second wave of the covid-19 but waiting for it to happen isn't the real deal here the first wave is getting worse in its sense and we need much more effective policy implementation if we do want to talk about a second wave then obviously i would hope things aren't handled in the same way i think that prevention techniques are essential in a sense but if you see we should also look at long term solutions if you do look at past global pandemics they have used the same methods of preventing the spread of these diseases washing hands is effective against any communicable disease but it should definitely not be the only call for action for this i have repeatedly suggested interactions between our political leaders and hopefully one day they will listen to me but till then all i ask is a general public take care of themselves this is the new normal and it won't go away easily before we move on to our interactive session as we just fully mentioned the new normal and mr rizetsky's highlight the fact that we will take time to get back to where we were before Mr. Fawcy, can you tell us about whether substantial changes are required in our world if we want to survive further challenges in the future? I'm glad you brought this up. Sitting here, I have seen that a lot of us have repeatedly mentioned that there is no going back to what we were. Honestly, there might not be a past to return to. This pandemic has helped us realize that maybe it's time for reformations. reformations in our political institutions reformations in our medical institutions and reformations in our social institutions we have to work hard and we have to start the chain somewhere this is not the end but the beginning to a new world it might sound a little philosophical but that is how our world works someone has to do the preaching honestly i would have left it to our beloved president but clearly he has important matters to attend to and thus we experts have to step in into these august gatherings and address the general public and ask you to just be safe i would like to thank all our experts today who have covered a wide range of topics and given us a lot of food for thought we now like to open the debate to some questions from our viewers who have been commenting the questions throughout today's program and the first question that we have here is what is the impact on the insurance industries or the environment uh, in the entertainment industries mr brzeski would you like to pitch in on that yeah sure uh, we didn't go into the details of the effects on separate industries but i can address insurance and entertainment industries because uh, if you think about it obviously in the insurance industry uh, there has been a surge in the number of people who've asked for health insurance or medical insurance 
and at the same time there has been a dip in travel insurance because of the, all the travel restrictions so it kind of depends on the type of insurance that a company is offering and then you can decide what kind of effect has been on them when you come to the entertainment industry now the entertainment industry is a big one like um, if you talk about malls shopping centers and theaters they have obviously been closed down for uh, quite a few uh, quite some time now and they have had a, ne a negative impact and even if you talk about theme parks like universal studios or disney which have been closed for over 2 to 3 months now have uh, had severe impacts actually coincidentally i think disney uh, in florida is opening today and disney in france is opening tomorrow and especially disney world in florida has seen a lot of criticism to this decision simply because florida is one of the states with the highest number of cases and the highest number of deaths but i think the united states has already shown us where their priorities lie at this point so i will not be commenting on that um coming back to other kinds of media i think digital media like video games or streaming platforms have definitely had more users in the past few months because as we know everybody has been stuck at home so they've definitely seen an increase in their users which has had a positive impact on them so yeah i think that about covers it all and if we go deep into them there are a lot of separate um, what do you call subsets in all these industries which will have different kinds of effects in the end another question we have been asked is we haven't seen our political leaders be too vocal about the current scenario are they afraid of what is going to happen or or are they afraid of taking care of it and don't want to create panic um this is directed to anthony fosti that's a really a very good question and i'm really glad that it just popped up after ms brzezki highlighted where um our political leaders um main platform stands so yes to a certain extent um firstly i thought that the absence of political leaders here was because they were afraid of dealing with this all of a sudden because we could see that um this year could have been the set for world wars and uh, cold wars and several you know political vendetta that has been going on but now that i see it, there are several nations and i i am privileged to live in a world where i get to see such leaders step in especially when we have female leaders stepping up um in specifically in new zealand and germany where they have worked very hard and they are helping their citizens i would have wished the same from our president as well but uh we've seen he does what he wants he has his own priorities but yes we will work on it and i'm pretty sure that um there will be a great outcome of all this and we'll come back stronger thank you for for your input mr fossey and the next question is directed to mr ban ki moon how important is international cooperation between na between nations in tackling this pandemic so please go ahead thank you so uh, this is absolutely true as the former secretary general of the united nations an organization aiming at international cooperation and as dr fauci just said this is a global village and international cooperation will aid the situation in so many aspects whether it is effective vaccine development and deployment whether it is continued continued surveillance to detect the reemergence of the virus or whether it is the continuous and strong support for less developed countries such as yemen international cooperation will go a long way in solving this crisis thank you mr ban ki moon we have another question telecommuting is a solution that everyone cannot afford in that case what alternatives could we have uh, any of you would like to pitch in on that um since i think i talked about telecommuting i would like to answer this question yes. sure. so i did highlight the fact that telecommuting can happen when and where it is possible considering the tremendous growth in the tertiary sector but other ways the main agenda remains the same that is to reduce carbon emissions and to reduce vehicle traffic now while telecommuting may not always work because not everyone can afford to do that 
what we can suggest, keeping in mind that a gender of us is to walk shorter distances rather than using a bike or a scooter or a car. So again, what I would like to say is that we have to put in a combined effort to this. Like, um, I think coincidentally, uh, Mr. Brzezowski talked about Disneyland, and there's a very good quote that I found by Mr. Walt Disney that says that whatever we accomplish in the end will belong to the entire group as a tribute to our combined effort. So keeping in mind the fact that all of us together can make a change and irrespective of the fact that telecommuting cannot be afforded, there are a hundred other things that we can do. All right, thank you, Ms. Masusa. And that is all we have time for, for today. We'd like to thank all our guests today who have been interviewed by our team of reporters. We'd also like to thank you for joining us today. This program has been brought to you from BBC UK. And from CNN 18 India, with the support of students from Wapping High School, London, and Elper International School, Pune. Goodbye and take care. All right, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you students. I think there's a huge round of applause for everybody, your thoughts, your researches, your statements and the entire presentation that you put in together was indeed commendable. I congratulate all of you and I encourage you to continue to be on this path where you all read, read and learn more. So thank you, I think it was a great presentation. Uh, Nicolette, why don't you say something? I just want to congratulate the students. They've done a huge amount of research and I think you can tell they have become real experts. And actually this is only the tip of the iceberg. The other research they've done on many other case studies and nations is quite incredible. And it's been terrific to see today and a, just a, a really exciting collaboration between the two schools. And we very much hope that we'll, we'll be able to do something like this again in the future. Well done. All right, on and with that note, uh, we leave for today and thank you to all the viewers who have joined us on Facebook and punched in all your questions, which our esteemed panelists have answered. Thank you very much for joining. Bye-bye.